All right, everybody, this video is a cautionary tale for you Disney World travelers out there so you know what to watch out for when it comes to wishy-washy food, outrageous prices, and snacks that could abandon you when you need them the most. These are our Disney food betrayals. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. Whether it's your first visit or your hundredth, some Disney World restaurants are gonna catch you off guard like a slap in the face, which is why I wanna talk about some personal experiences I've had with Disney World restaurant portrayals and that some of our team members have had as well. And we're gonna give you some advice to lessen those blows or even better, avoid them entirely. Now, you might be like, Restaurants are betraying you? Isn't that a little dramatic? Yes, possibly a little dramatic, but stick with me and you'll see what I mean. We're gonna start with unpredictable food quality. Now, Disney World restaurants are so expensive, as you know, and it's really, really hard to go into those restaurants and plop down 30 to 80 bucks for a meal or even more if you're there with anyone besides yourself. Like, you're dropping like 200 bucks on a relatively middle of the road meal in Disney World, and you just wanna be really, really careful about where your money goes. That's why we're here, that's why we do what we do. Maybe you have some experiences with that, or maybe it's something you're worried will happen when you go to Disney World. Spending a lot of money on a restaurant that gets mixed reviews can be stressful for sure. So let's talk about some of the most common perpetrators in this arena of betrayals. Here's the thing about eating at Epcot specifically. So many options are really, really good. So when a track record for one or two restaurants is about 50-50, sometimes great, sometimes not, that stands out. And it definitely earns that particular location a reputation. And you'll see that it's real easy to get a reservation there because everybody knows that it's, you know, not always gonna be consistently good. And a lot of the times they're consistently bad. So we're gonna start with San Angel or San Angel. I know you guys have told me to say it both ways. So you can let me know in the comments what your preference is, but Restaurante inside the Mexico Pavilion. This is one of the most beautiful and romantic restaurants in Epcot. The atmosphere is stunning. You've got the low lighting, the views of the Grand Fiesta tour boats floating by, the vibrant village setting, that volcano in the distance with a hidden Mickey in the smoke, if you haven't seen it yet. And the first time I reviewed this place, I really, really, really liked it. The tostadas were great. The margaritas were strong. I really enjoy, I always enjoy that chicken of the kings because it's basically chicken with cheese and that's what I love to order. But I've been back multiple times and I would say about 50% of the time things are definitely off. The tostadas were smaller, the chips weren't house made, the steak was overcooked, the sides were bland. Now what happened to the restaurant I knew and loved before? This happens all the time especially at this particular restaurant. Other things I don't love about this one you're sitting really really close to your neighbors and I'm not a huge fan of that but overall when it comes to food quality and service it is an inconsistent restaurant. So just be aware of that if you're headed here. Now the same can be said for another restaurant at Epcot, Coral Reef. We got another great setting replaced in here. The dining room is surrounded by that giant indoor living seas aquarium, which is home to over 2000 sea creatures who come and hang out with you at your table, you know, with a big wall of glass between you. And we've got a couple of reviews sort of floating around on the DFB website, get it? Okay, that talk about how I really enjoyed the food here along with the ever-changing aquarium scenery. It's a great spot to take little kids because they super love looking at that stuff. But recently, the quality has been less of a coin toss and more of a guaranteed mediocre dining experience over at Coral Reef. I could have a nice bowl of shrimp and grits with great shrimp to grit ratio and tasty warm chocolate wave molten cake for dessert during one meal. And for the next three meals, I could have spent $30 on dry, chewy fish. Not great odds. So what's the solution to this kind of a betrayal? This isn't going to be Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde kind of thing when you have booked a reservation 60 days in advance and you're about to drop 200 bucks on a meal. Well, places like this, which by the way, also include sci-fi dine-in, that can be super inconsistent. Crystal Palace at Magic Kingdom, that can be super inconsistent. Anyway, they're not inherently bad places to dine. If you're looking for a romantic getaway, San Angel Inn is a gorgeous setting to choose. Even if your tacos are just okay, your margs will probably still be potent and you can add a little extra extra fun to your meal by ordering that 50th anniversary celebration Fiesta Pyramid, which is super cool. It's a hard chocolate shell pinata shaped like the Mexico Pavilion Pyramid, and you can whack it open for a bunch of mousse and toffee inside. It's very pricey, but it's memorable for a special occasion. So good setting, good dessert, 
potentially bad meal isn't worth it to you, you can make that judgment call. Now, if you're looking for a table service restaurant that you know will keep your kids entertained throughout the duration, Coral Reef can help with that. Fishies are fun for adults and kiddos to watch while waiting for the food to arrive, and the kids' menu does offer an approachable surf and turf variety that your little ones might enjoy. Now, if you want to dine in the most uniquely themed restaurant in Hollywood Studios, Sci-Fi Dine-In still provides that. Nowhere else on property is going to get you the chance to eat diner food in a convertible car while watching black and white movie clips from really old sci-fi films. Plus, it's got alcoholic and non-alcoholic milkshakes, so that's a good way to win us over. And as far as Crystal Palace goes, it's still a solid option if you've got a big group with a lot of different eaters traveling with you to Magic Kingdom. Plus, the restaurant still has touches of the Winnie the Pooh gang throughout the surrounding greenery, and if you happen to get a seat by the window while the Festival of Fantasy Parade is happening, you might be able to watch it from a distance while you chow down on your prime rib and mashed potatoes. So am I saying you should definitely book these restaurants? No, they are definitely inconsistent restaurants that you never really know what you're going to get, and they're all pretty pricey. But understand the pros and cons for restaurants like this and figure out what is the highest priority. Is atmosphere the highest priority? Is immersive theming the highest priority? Or is it getting bang for your buck? If that's the case, then these probably aren't the right choices. So when you're thinking about your Disney restaurants and what you want to book and what you want to get up at 5 a.m. 60 days in advance to make sure you lock in, then and I fully recommend reading a bunch of our reviews on the website, going and watching any videos that we have about those restaurants, because I'm usually pretty honest about the pros and cons for these. So you can gauge, well, AJ says the food isn't that great, but the atmosphere is great and it'll keep my kids entertained. Okay, maybe that's the most important thing. And only you know what's important for you. So I'm going to give you in all these reviews the, you know, the pros and cons, what's good and what's bad. And you can figure out if those pros outweigh the cons for you. Okay, the next way some restaurants will betray you and me is not getting the full dining experience. So tell me if this sounds familiar. You book a popular Disney World character meal. You're really excited to get the chance to chit chat with these characters. The day finally comes when you get to dine at the restaurant and then you blink twice and it's over. Wait, did Cinderella even talk to us? And did you get the side shoulder or bear hug from Mickey Mouse? And why is everything such a blur? And your server is basically pushing you out the door and telling you not to let it hit you on your way out, right? So suddenly you're left with a really full stomach, a hefty bill, and the feeling you've just been unknowingly rushed through the very meal you've been looking forward to for so long. How can you get that time and money back? Or even better, how can you get a better experience for the money you spent? Okay, let's break this one down. I often talk about how much of a mixed bag Cinderella's Royal Table is in Magic Kingdom, and there are other restaurants that sort of fit this bill as well. On the one hand, it's literally dining in Cinderella Castle. Like, how much more of a Disney fight experience can you get, right? The dining room makes you feel like you're going to get the royal treatment. You've got those high ceilings, golden chandeliers, the enormous stained glass windows, medieval looking crests and flags decorating the walls. It's beautiful. You're in a castle. And for some, that might be worth the prefix price alone. Just the bragging rights of being able to say you've eaten at Cindy's place is enough for this signature restaurant to be one of the most difficult advanced dining reservations to get ever. And that can prove problematic even for those who do get lucky enough to score a table here because the overall experience feels like it's been put in fast forward mode. And that's a little nod to all of us who actually had VCRs when we were kids. So here's the deal. The restaurant has to turn tables over as quickly as possible to accommodate as many guests as possible, which yay for efficiency because you got a reservation, which means they were somehow able to make it so that more than just one group of people can dine here a day. But this is a really expensive meal and it doesn't always live up to the hype. What makes matters worse is that Cinderella's Royal Table is still running as a modified experience as of this recording. So instead of seeing a ton of princesses at once, like Snow White, Aurora, Jasmine, and Ariel, you only get to see Cinderella before your meal, which is great. We love her, but you only see her for a brief period of time to exchange a word or two and get a picture taken, kind of like a celebrity sighting at a comic book convention, because we all have had that experience, not just Bria, right? Right. Okay. So I'll be fair, I was saying this was a problem way before the park closures, way before you stopped being able to meet five princesses and you can now only meet Cinderella. I was saying they were turning the tables over way too fast, even back then. And now they're turning the tables over fast and you're only meeting one princess and the price tag is still astronomical. So that's a huge problem as far as I'm concerned and maybe as far as you're concerned too. So I feel like, hey, I'm paying just as much as I was before and I'm getting less for my 
money. And that seems to be a little bit of a theme with a lot of what Disney's doing at the moment. So that's something to take into consideration when it comes to what restaurants you're choosing. Even character dining experiences that have fully returned to their normal meet and greet shenanigans like Chef Mickey's at Disney's Contemporary Resort, where you've got all the characters are there and they're coming up and they're giving you hugs and everything. It's back to normal, but they have that we need to keep things moving vibe. It's not the character's fault. It's just the way the day's been paced out for them. So what could have been a really cute and magical moment with your kids seeing the Fab Five and their chef outfits turns into a drive-by picture op with quick hugs and signatures and then their character handler kind of shooing them along. No extra interactions to make the experience truly memorable. So yeah, raise your hand if you've had that experience too. I've had that experience a lot at Disney World and I understand why they have to do it, but it ends up kind of making you feel like you were not really getting the full value for the money you put down for that. So here's the solution. Character dining isn't always going to feel like you're more of an obligation than a person these characters genuinely want to interact with. Some of our reporters have found better luck with booking a character dining experience toward the end of the evening just because the restaurant isn't as rushed and they don't need to get through another large group of people. There are also a handful of character meals on property that book up less quickly, but still have fewer tables available in the dining room. That way characters have the chance to provide more of that one-on-one -on -one interaction without feeling the need to skedaddle on over to the next table. Now, Garden Grill at Epcot is one of our favorites here. It definitely gives you the chance to interact with Pluto, Farmer Mickey, Chip, and Dale a few more times than you can maybe see Mickey and friends over at Chef Mickey's because it's a much smaller restaurant here and they come around pretty regularly. And then there's Topolino's Terrace over at Disney's Riviera Resort. That gives you a chance to meet Mickey, Minnie, Donald, and Daisy in their artistic attire as you munch on a morning spread of pastries, Mickey waffles, and other popular breakfast foods that'll fill you up before you start your day. Generally speaking, Topolino's doesn't get too terribly crowded, so characters have plenty of time to show off their creative outfits and chit chat with you. Well, you'll be doing most of the chit chatting, but they're all great listeners. But if you really want to book a meal over at one of the other more popular character restaurants, like I mentioned before, you need to set your expectations ahead of time especially now that it's getting into Disney's peak season and the turnover rate is going to be even more important to them than ever. Now, one more silver lining. The speedy service isn't always a bad thing for guests. You might prefer being served quickly so you can get back to the parks and back to riding the rides and seeing the shows. Even Disney World's faster table service experiences can still wind up being 45 minutes to an hour long, which could be plenty of time for you to enjoy the atmosphere. And hey, you're still guaranteed a picture with these characters, so if that's all you're really looking for and it prevents you from having to stand in a lengthy meet and greet line later on, then perfect. No formalities necessary. So here's my main takeaway. Make sure that the character dining experience you're choosing has more than just characters for you to enjoy. Look at those menus, read up on the DFB reviews and the restaurants. Think about the atmosphere that you're going into. Make sure it's a comfortable atmosphere. Check out pictures of the overall theming because if you're coming there for characters and characters alone you might just be better off waiting in a meet and greet line for a bit and saving that money for a restaurant that you and your party will enjoy even more all right we've now gotten to the part of this video you've all been waiting for i'm sure and that is of course the sky high prices yep it's disney world i get it even quick service food's going to be more expensive than wendy's four for four dollars you'll find back home but for me Disney World food is something I'd rather be budgeting for than, say, another souvenir to shove into my suitcase because I love food and I hate dusting things. So when I budget for a restaurant, I already know what I should expect to pay when I visit. That way I can keep the sticker shock at bay. But my plans can be foiled, of course, and often are, if the quality or quantity of the food doesn't line up with the asking price and what I expected. Then the sticker shock shadows come a-creeping back up to the surface. So there are several restaurants on Disney World property that specialize in steakhouse cuts, but STK Orlando over at Disney Springs is on the bottom rung for me. If you're looking for a restaurant that specializes in steaks and will pump up the party, then ignore me. In the evenings, STK turns down the lights and cranks up the jams. But if you're just looking for the best steak at Disney, you're not only going to not find it here, more than likely, but you're also going to pay more for the steak than you would at some of the better options available on property, which I'll mention in just a second. Then again, if you've been hanging around the channel a while, you might already know what I'm going to shout out. Not only is the steak rather overpriced here, but many other items are way too steep for what's being offered. And I'll be honest, I've had a good steak at STK. Some of the food is actually quite good. The appetizers are excellent, but the service combined with the atmosphere, combined with the price tag, make this not worth it. 
Now, I love my mac and cheese, but it's really hard for me to stomach paying $18 to $42 for mac and cheese at STK. Yeah, not kidding. If you get the side order, I'll say it again, side order of the mac and cheese trio, you're going to wind up paying $42 for sides. And then there's Cape May Cafe at Disney's Beach Club Resort. This buffet-style restaurant is not bad. I would eat here and not complain, even though Beaches and Cream is literally next door. Not the point. The point is snow crab legs. Yep, snow crab legs. Before the 2020 shutdown, the $42 per person asking price for dinner here wasn't the worst, especially for those who are big into the surf and turf. Because on top of the other seafood specialty items you could get from the buffet, you could also get unlimited snow crab legs. And that's not a bad deal. However, the restaurant changed up their menu a few months back when it returned to its buffet style setup. Now, on top of the $42 per person asking price, you've got to pay $29 for access to their unlimited crab leg supply. Talk about major sticker shock and unexpected extra costs, right? Okay, so what restaurants have quality food that are worth the asking price? Well, we released a video not too long ago talking about some of the best restaurants for 2022. If you haven't watched that yet, I highly recommend it. We got a lot of bangers on that list and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with them. But just to give you a little teaser for one of the restaurants you can expect to see in that video, let me just shout one out here. This is where I got to give some love to Steakhouse 71 in Disney's Contemporary Resort. The Steakhouse Cuts menu might only be available for dinner, but when it is available, the prices for the steaks range between $29 and $38. You hear that, STK Orlando? The most expensive steak on this Cuts menu, the juicy and tender 12-ounce roasted prime rib and classic Yorkshire pudding, which I have ordered myself and it is incredible, comes with your choice of side and specialty sauce and is less expensive than ordering your mac and cheese trio. That's wild. I also want to give a shout out to Yachtsman Steakhouse over at Disney's Yacht Club Resort. It's a little steakhouse. It's pretty underrated, but its butcher cuts are thick and done with true expertise. You can get a 16 ounce ribeye at Yachtsman for 59 bucks, while a 16 ounce cowgirl ribeye is gonna cost you 92 over at STK. Since we're already working with numbers, let's do a little math over at Cape May Cafe. Immediately, you're expected to pay $42 for the buffet, but if you're really craving some crab legs and you add that extra 29 bucks on top of the buffet price, then you're looking at paying over $71 for your meal. Now, if you're really hungry, you may still think this is reasonable. It is a buffet. After all, it is seafood. I understand crab legs so you can eat as much of the seafood spread as you like. But if crab's really all you're after, well, there are seafood places even outside the Disney World bubble that can hook you up with more for less. You're in Orlando, after all. But if you're wanting to enjoy other crab-inspired dishes for less on property, the Boathouse in Disney Springs has the Jumbo Lump Crab Cake for $29.50, along with a lot of other stellar seafood options, like hand-breaded coconut shrimp, the dockside shrimp boil, and the grilled fresh mahi sandwich. If you're staying at Disney's Beach Club and you really want to try their buffet, but you're not interested in the crab legs or paying $42 for a buffet in general, then you could always hit up this restaurant during their breakfast hours instead. Breakfast is a pretty standard spread here, but you'll only pay 25 bucks per adult and $14 per kid to experience it. So bring on those salted caramel and vanilla cream beach buns. They're really good. Next on our list of betrayals is... Switching to prefix menus, so many prefix menus. If you're not familiar with the prefix menu craze, let me break it down for you real quick. Restaurants with prefix menus mean the minimum price you're gonna pay for your meal is predetermined before you're ever seated. Prefix meals usually consist of an appetizer, entree, and dessert, but that's not necessarily always the case. Sometimes apps and or desserts may not be included, and sometimes non-alcoholic drinks could be added onto the price. It just depends on where you're dining and if you're visiting during breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Prefix meals have their pros and cons, but typically speaking, one of the main cons is that a restaurant could be forcing you to pay for a lot more food than you wanted to eat. Shades of the dining plan, right? Some people are satisfied with an entree alone, and some may just want an appetizer as their entree. Many groups tend to purchase one appetizer and split it amongst themselves. But for those prefix meals, every single person in the party must pay for one appetizer, one entree, one dessert. Now, there are a few reasons why I think this prefix trend is appearing more and more frequently around Disney restaurants, but that's a whole other video entirely. In fact, we've covered a lot of those points in a DFB post on our site, so I'll go ahead and link it in the description below if you're curious. But what I will say is that I can accept prefix menus to a certain extent, especially when they're attached to new restaurants and that's all I've ever known said restaurants to offer. Prefix menus become frustrating when they're applied to already existing Disney World restaurants that didn't used to have those sort of price constraints and now all of a sudden I have to pay for a bunch of food I didn't want to eat. 
Now the big one here is Be Our Guest Restaurant in Magic Kingdom. When Be Our Guest first opened in New Fantasyland back in 2012, it was offered as a quick service or fast food location during lunch. You could get in line, order a carved turkey sandwich for around $10.99, and dine in the Beast's Castle. Peachy keen. Awesome. For dinner, however, it was a table service restaurant with an a la carte menu. But in 2018, the table service switched over to a prefix. It was a three-course affair for dinner, but kept lunch as a quick service alternative. Then the shutdown happened. And when the parks finally reopened in July of 2020, Be Our Guest Restaurant reopened with yet another big change under its belt. Today, both lunch and dinner have prefix menus. So instead of a $10.99 sandwich for lunch, you're looking at a $62 three-course meal. And it really is painful for those of us who used to love and tout that excellent deal that was lunch. Disney will always catch up with you if you say something's an excellent deal. <laughs> now, more recently, the fine dining restaurant at Disney's contemporary resort, California Grill, has also switched over to a prefix menu, since many of the offerings have been brought on to celebrate Disney World's 50th anniversary. This switcheroo to a prefix menu here is a little less drastic than what we had at Be Our Guest, since menu prices were already steep at California Grill, even before they became prefix. But it will cost significantly more to dine here now than it did before, since appetizers, entrees, and desserts are all included in the $89 per person price tag. When back in the day, you could get a sushi roll here for maybe 28 bucks and call it good. So what's your solution? Well, do I enjoy seeing these price gouges happening at already established Disney World restaurants that once promised a much different asking price? No, not at all. However, prefix prices at restaurants aren't always a bad thing. If you're the type of person who gets kind of overwhelmed with a ton of food options, then prefix menus will help you narrow down the scope to just a few that you can easily choose from. Because who wants a lot of different choices, right? Yeah, that nobody wants that. And if you and the people in your travel party are used to ordering appetizers, entrees, and desserts anyway, whether the menu is fixed price or not, then a prefix menu could maybe wind up being a better deal for you than having to order each item individually. But the dining plan theory applies here too, that Disney's not going to price something at a lower price than they could get on average from people paying a la carte. So they're always gonna price a prefix or the dining plan at a much, much higher level than you would normally pay because it's the highest sort of average cost. But again, the dining plan is a whole other topic for a different day. But what people do like about the dining plan is that they already know what they're going to pay. So they can budget for a meal without stressing about what it might cost outside of their expectations. So if you go to California Grill, you know you're going to pay 89 bucks no matter what, right? So there you go. And then there are some prefix menus that are just legitimately good deals, like the one you'll find over at La Creperie de Paris in Epcot. La Creperie gives you the option of whether you'd like to order a la carte or off the prefix menu. But if you go with the latter, you can get your choice of soup or salad, your choice of one galette and a glass of hard cider, soda, or juice, and your choice of one dessert crepe, all for $34.95. So is a prefix restaurant gonna be worth it for you and your group? Well, before you book that advanced dining reservation, you'll need to do some, wait for it, research. That's right, that's what a Disney trip is these days, right? It's a bunch of research. So you wanna know something awesome though? We've done all that research for you. I know, I know, hold your applause. If you hit up dfbstore.com, grab our 2022 guide to Walt Disney World Dining, which has honest, detailed reviews of all these prefix restaurants, plus all the rest. That's right. We got all the Disney World restaurants in this giant digital guide, ranging from quick service to character dining to snack carts, everything you got to make choices about. We're helping you out. Also, we've got snack guides for you to look at so you can decide which snacks you want to dole out your money for as well. Whatever you decide to order, type in the code YouTube before checking out to save some money on your overall purchase. And don't forget, these guides are 100% money back guarantee. If you don't love them, if they don't help you or work for you, just let us know and we'll get your money back to you. Now, speaking of snacks, it's a great transition for my next point, stripping away my favorite snack items. Make the clock reverse, bring back what once was mine. Consider this an in memoriam for some Disney World foods that once were and are no more. Don't bring out the tissues immediately though. I promise to also tell you about the Disney World foods that swooped in to fill the snack shaped holes in our hearts. So let's talk about ice cream treats and exclusive Dole Whips. They can be rather elusive, but some stick around for longer than usual. And some specialty treats might even pop up 
on the permanent menus for a bit to give you a false sense of like, we're gonna be here forever, don't you worry, and then they totally leave you high and dry. We're looking at you, Storybook Treats, and your Peter Pan float. And you're guilty too, Aloha Isle, and your Kakamora float, thanks to your coconut soft serve and moist chocolate cake pop, you made blue curacao look good. But both of these fruity floats were once part of the Magic Kingdom menus and have since disappeared. I'm also sad to report that my once favorite peanut butter pie from Contempo Cafe and Disney's Contemporary Resort has been a little bit spoiled. Instead of it having that delicious and fluffy peanut butter dome on top, it became modified for the 50th anniversary. So no more peanut butter dome, just a lot of frills and extra chocolate toppings that I don't need personally. I just need the peanut butter dome. Now it is still called the peanut butter pie and I know a lot of you still love it and I still recommend it, but it's like calling Darth Vader Anakin when he's clearly crossed over to the dark side. And who remembers the Cheshire and Mad Hatter cake cups that used to live happily at the Cheshire Cafe in Magic Kingdom back in the day? They were a little bit of cake, a lot of bit of frosting, just the way we like it. And these treats must have fallen into a rabbit hole out of sight, out of mind, because once they were gone, they never came back. And it's so sad. But here's the good thing. Just because these treats are gone doesn't mean A, they won't come back. Disney World treats come back all the time. Or B, there's not something just as good nearby. Like I mentioned before, ice cream and Dole Whip treats can be elusive, which is both a good and bad thing. It's bad because when we find one we really like, it's crushing to see it leave, but it's also good because that usually means a brand new one is gonna come replace it, giving us something new to fall in love with and eventually wind up with our hearts broken again. When it leaves again, it's a cruel cycle and we subject ourselves to it time and time again. A brand new line of ice cream treats just entered the Disney Springs scene not too long ago, made our eyes go all cartoony heart shape. Over at Marketplace Snacks, you can get five different types of character bubble waffle sundaes. There's the Mickey cookie waffle with hot fudge and cookie crumbles, the mini sweet strawberry waffle sundae with sliced strawberries and white chocolate pearl crisps, the Pluto peanut butter waffle with chocolate covered pretzels and peanut butter sauce, and Donald lemon and blueberry waffle with lemon curd, blueberries, and popping candy, and the goofy peanut grand waffle with hot fudge, peanuts, sliced bananas, sliced strawberries, mini M&Ms, and a cherry. Yeah, Goofy's got a lot going on over there. Speaking of Disney Springs coming in clutch, although I do miss those dear cake cups from Cheshire Cafe, frosting shots are also near and dear to my heart. And you can find those for a buck 50 over at Gideon's Bakehouse and over at Sprinkles Cupcakes as well. Now, just because a Disney food disappears doesn't always mean it's gonna be gone for good. Like I said, sometimes it comes crawling back into our lives with its tail between its legs, begging us to accept it again and we will always accept it again. We welcome back the carrot cake cookie in Disney's Hollywood Studios, those Ohana noodles at the Polynesian Village Resort, the Hey Hey Cone, which left Magic Kingdom but popped up in Disney's Typhoon Lagoon, and several returning booths and eats during Epcot's festivals. So it's always good to look over Disney World menus on their website to make sure you know what's gonna be available and what won't be for your upcoming trip. You can also keep up with the ever-changing menus through our DFB newsletter. When you sign up, you'll receive updates, reviews, and even Disney discounts straight to your email. I'll put the newsletter sign-up link in the description below. So are we on an emotional roller coaster? Absolutely, but we made it through and now we're on the other side. Good for us. One last important thing. Many of the points I covered today are circumstantial. Just because my feelings were hurt once or twice or even three times at these restaurants doesn't mean I always feel kicked down by them and definitely doesn't mean I won't be back to see if the quality of food and service improves the next time around because we all love a good comeback story and believe it or not, a lot of these restaurants have gone good and bad in their histories. So understand that these restaurants restaurants are all representative because there's a lot of different restaurants in Disney World that could fit into each of these categories, even if I didn't talk about them. So just keep an eye out for our reviews. We do reviews all the time of these restaurants. We always go back to these restaurants regularly just to see how they're doing today. Because you know what happens? Disney World restaurants change menus. They change sourcing, food sourcing. They change chefs. They change servers. And so when all that stuff is mutable, that means that your experience is mutable as well. And it can be very, very very different from one year to the next and even from one day to the next. So hopefully this will help you keep an eye out for what's new, what's changed, and how a restaurant's doing now. Whew, thanks for listening everybody and thanks for watching. I hope this helps as you start to plan your Disney World trips and book those advanced dining reservations 60 days out. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog and we'll see you real soon.